Have you seen Moneyball? It's a really excellent sports movie from 2011, chronicling the story of how Billy Bean, the general manager for the Oakland A's, transformed baseball. At the start of the film, the team is in a rut. They had just lost the 2001 seasonal division to the Yankees, and were in the process of losing three star players. With their limited budget, the team was no longer competitively viable. There are rich teams, and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap, and then there's us. The team can no longer win against the odds stacked against them, so Bean decided that, in order to win, he had to change the odds. With the help of Peter Brand, a 25-year-old Yale economics graduate, Bean came up with a completely new method of player assessment, nicknamed Moneyball. Disregarding all other methods of player worth, Bean mainly focused on one statistic while building his new team. Why do you like him? Because he gets on base. With this team of misfit yet consistent players, the Oakland A's over the 2002 season would go on to win 20 consecutive wins, the longest win streak in baseball history. Despite all their flaws, their consistent on-base percentage led them to glory. And while they didn't win that year's World Series, they did succeed at changing the game. And where baseball has Billy Bean, Hollywood has Kevin Feige. With the goal of adapting the Marvel comic books faithfully to the big screen, Feige installed a similar philosophy while building his dream team. It doesn't matter if the movies are flawed. It doesn't matter if the stars aren't A-listers. And it doesn't matter if this is the director's first action movie. There's only one real stat that matters. While other franchises soared to the heavens or crashed and burned, Marvel Studios was uniquely consistent offering solid b to a adventure films that audiences could unwind and relax with. Like the 2002 Oakland A's baseball season, the first phase of Marvel films was a miracle of strategy and circumstance. Throughout this phase, they scored base hit after base hit. Iron Man, Thor, Captain America. And now that the bases were loaded, The Avengers, the big team-up film in development for over four years, was on deck. Avengers walks up to the plate, The Avengers was a hit. It was a hit unlike anything the industry had seen. And not only was it a hit, but people loved it. They loved this world and these characters, and they wanted to see more. And so we did. Year after year, two to three times each, we would come back for that warm Marvel consistency. And the more times they got on base, the more we grew to trust them. We knew that we had to see all of them to catch all the Easter eggs, to see how our favorite characters would interact when they finally crossed paths, and to see where this big grand story was heading. And there was an endpoint it was heading to, as the self-called Infinity Saga came to a close with the release of Avengers Endgame, where we got a fitting conclusion to the characters that made us fall in love with this world in the first place. There were other home runs before Endgame, but the way that film hit when it did well, it was one of my favorite movie-going experiences of all time. It's truly a movie built by the ones before it, a story that stands on its own yet rewards the viewings of the hits and even misses that came before. It's the movie that finally fulfilled the mission statement laid out by Iron Man all those years ago. It's one of my favorite Marvel movies, hands down, and despite some loose ends, could easily serve as the ending to this entire universe. And in many ways, it was. I mean, it was immediately followed up by a mediocre Spider-Man movie, but after that, the future of Marvel, for the first time, was uncertain. And right when this new phase was about to get started, <laughs> the blip happened, and our world kinda went to shit. Which meant, no Marvel for over a year. While some escapism would have certainly helped during this time, that break from Marvel really cemented how impactful an ending Endgame was. What more do you need to tell when you've finally said goodbye? It turns out, a whole lot. If the last phase of Marvel was all about building to one big conclusion, this condensed fourth phase has taken the exact opposite approach using the grand climax as a jumping-off point to branch off into countless unforeseen directions. 
Whereas Marvel in the past would balance new projects with returning franchises, Phase 4 was an onslaught of new faces, new places, and when we do get familiar characters, we see them in unfamiliar environments or are using them to set up said new faces. It's the four-year trial and error process of Phase 1, crammed into two relentless years. Now that we're finishing Marvel's most exhaustive phase ever, I thought it would be important to assess how this new direction has been going so far, and to highlight the shortcomings of these productions in the hopes that Marvel can tell the best versions of these stories they can. Before I begin, I do want to preface that I still very much enjoy the MCU. Each of these productions have been fun and entertaining and for the most part proved to be worth their time. However, I would be lying if I said that I am as enthusiastic for this phase of Marvel projects as I was in the past for the Infinity Saga, and I do think that with this new direction, part of the magic that defined Marvel Studios has been lost in the process. This is not a review of each MCU production in Phase 4, but instead a review of how they all come together to form a larger cohesive story. A critique of how Marvel maintains a universe. This is the post-endgame problem. One of the defining elements of the Infinity Saga was, of course, the Infinity Stones, the universe-shaping MacGuffins that drove 90% of the conflict from the first Avenger all the way through Endgame. While heavily criticized as the films were released due to their repetitive nature, I do believe that these films centering around these stones really helped shape and define what the MCU is today. It made it so that even though these characters had yet to cross paths, they were all still part of the same battle, making their inevitable crossovers not only organic, but necessary. The Infinity Stones were the glue that held all these stories together, leading to the surprising interaction and growth that would become the MCU's greatest asset. So with the Infinity Stones now dealt with, returned to their timelines never to be meddled with again, what is to become the new glue that brings all these storylines and developing characters together? Is it the fallout of the blip and the struggle of rebuilding fallen societies? Maybe it's the introduction of the Celestials and the galactic oversight they have over this universe. Or is it the branched timelines created by Endgame and the chaotic worlds of the multiverse? Or is it the... Yep, you get it. It's all the above. For the first time in the MCU, it really feels as though these characters are off in their own separate worlds on trajectories that don't overlap. The issues that Sam, Wanda, and Clint deal with on Earth don't seem to tie into the galactic stakes of the Eternals or the time-bending shenanigans of Loki. This, of course, inherently isn't a criticism. In fact, I would say the biggest strength of Phase 4 so far is the sheer diversity of stories being told. For casual viewers not strictly following Alon, Phase 4 has taken on a trail mix approach. With such a variety of tastes, we can now pick and choose the stories we want to follow. But this individuality comes at a price. A price I imagine will be very problematic going forward, and that's the lack of cohesion. For instance, I enjoyed the characters in Shang-Chi and Eternals, but I can't imagine them teaming up for a shared adventure anytime soon. They both seem to be on fixed paths, wrestling with their own demons, with no care for what the other is going through. The magic of Marvel isn't just these characters on their own, it's also how they come together. Marvel really hit their stride when they started mixing and matching the heroes in their solo projects, bringing in Black Widow for Winter Soldier, Hulk for Ragnarok, Civil War works as a standalone Captain America film, and an Avengers film at the same time. It's clear to me that these characters work best when they're together. It wasn't just that these characters interacted, but that the consequences of each character's storyline led into the greater narrative. The destruction of S.H.I.E.L.D. and exposing of Hydra and Winter Soldier established the stakes for Age of Ultron. The endings to Ragnarok and Black Panther set the stage for Infinity War. And pretty much all of Phase 3 was a response to the events of Civil War. The overlapping storylines and filmmakers building on each other's narratives are what made Marvel a universe. But in the era of the multiverse, it seems this technique is being abandoned. Eternals ends with the biggest stakes event in this universe save for Infinity War. The entire world is nearly destroyed, and at the end, a giant fucking celestial comes right up to Earth to threaten the planet. This is a universe-altering moment. 
and yet we only see it from the Eternals' perspective, because this conflict only concerns them. Everyone else only needs to deal with the conflicts in their own narratives. The films and shows try to connect the stories, but they only manage to do so through name drops and quick cameos. In almost every subsequent release, Steve Rogers and Tony Stark are brought up and have their absence mentioned. So now that Captain Rogers and Iron Man are both gone, who do you think is going to lead the Avengers? I could lead them. But instead of making the universe feel connected, it only goes to highlight how much we miss anchor characters like those two, and how lost the MCU can feel without them. This all leads to one big question. Where is this all heading? That's a question necessary for all stories, as we want to know whether our two hours or eight episodes of investment will be worth the payoff. And perhaps these stories aren't building to some big grand conclusion, maybe they're just telling their own self-contained stories like the vast majority of films and television we see. In which case, great. However, just like every other film or television show, these stories need to lead to their own satisfying conclusions and character arcs that incentivize us coming back. And uh, yeah, about that. There's this moment two-thirds into the film adaptation where Charlie Kaufman is seeking advice on how to finish his script from Robert McKee. You know, the dude that every video essay references? Anyway, the nugget of advice that McKee gives Kaufman to finish his script is to nail the third act. You can have flaws, problems, but wow them in the end. You've got a hit. The first phase of Marvel films is a testament to this advice. As one large story, it isn't perfect. There were some major stumbles in the setup films, but they wowed us in the end, and that's all that matters. Not only do I believe this advice, but I believe the inverse is true. Stumble at the third act, and you can kill an otherwise promising story. And when it comes to Phase 4 stories so far, nearly every single one of them has started out promising with an interesting hook, only to trip and faceplant right at the finish line, falling back on outdated tropes Marvel should be far away from at this point. WandaVision starts out as a brilliant deconstruction on sitcom storytelling, using it as a metaphor for grief and the failure to move on, and then over the final two episodes absolves Wanda of all wrongdoing and evolves into a generic CGI mirror match. Black Widow starts with a compelling dramatic focus on Natasha confronting the sins of her past and taking accountability for her actions, and then ends in a final battle where everything goes comically right and none of the characters actually face any consequences. Shang-Chi builds up such a compelling conflict between Shan and Wenwu with a final battle centered around the right and Ron ways to move on from tragedy, and then throws all that work out the window for a battle with a giant dragon. But I believe we can do better. Across the board, especially on the television front, Marvel has struggled with its climaxes this phase. These weak climaxes are a reflection of the Marvel team not quite adapting to the strengths of episodic storytelling, as these shows feel like two-hour movies stretched into four-hour series. Not only do they lack the depth and self-contained adventures one gets from a serialized story, but they also miss out on the finality and catharsis that can come from a singular film. What really doesn't help things is that pretty much all of these shows relied on one trope that needs to be buried six feet underground and that's the surprise villain. Surprise villains are what you do when you don't actually want to build a meaningful conflict or dynamic between your main hero and villain. I will give them a pass in family films, as kids do need to be taught not to trust every nice person they see, but these reveals do not come with any catharsis or learning for their heroes. In WandaVision's case, it exists to take away responsibility from Wanda's actions. It's also worth noting that when every story ends with a surprise villain, it's no longer a surprise, you're conditioning us to see this coming. The main reason these villains are kept as secrets is because these finales do not mark the end of their stories. These are important antagonists that comic fans know all too well, and will surely have long-lasting effects on the MCU going forward. If anything, their surprise entrance is more an introduction for them into this world as a whole, commandeering the shows they debut in. They're put at the end so as to be as fresh as possible in the viewer's mind. Their introduction themselves is the payoff. The ending that pained me the most of all of Phase 4 was Loki. 
the multiverse setting was a perfect fit for the character, with the manipulative nature of the TVA effectively countering the controlling and disruptive nature of Loki. For five wonderful episodes, the narrative thoroughly interrogated Loki as he unraveled the TVA, with him learning in the process what it truly means to love oneself. And then, for the final episode, we mainly focused on the introduction of Kane the Conqueror, the mystery man behind the TVA, and delayed any and all resolution between our Lokis for a second season. Marvel, for the most part, have been good at organically setting up its future characters and storylines, that's what the post-credit teases are for, but here is a story stopping dead in its tracks to set up an antagonist for a completely separate film, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Or as I like to call it, Ant-Man and the Wasp. This could potentially work if all these characters were crossing paths in an upcoming Avengers project, but they all seem to be in their own lane, meaning these stories must be satisfying on their own. The stories Marvel told in Phase 4 have been fun, entertaining, and often exhilarating, but few of them have been truly satisfying, which becomes a real issue when it comes to their frequency. The frequency of Marvel projects has always been a contentious topic, and over the last two years, most people have found their breaking point. I think I speak for everyone when I say, this is too much. It isn't healthy to absorb this much content from one source. Disney has always structured their releases so as to be the main studio audiences will flock to when they go to the movies or watch a television show, but now it seems they are trying to achieve this with the MCU alone. They've actually reached a point where the hype machines seem to be overlapping and cannibalizing each other. Loki took a lot of attention away from Black Widow's release, the Multiverse of Madness overshadowed the Moon Knight finale, and No Way Home hype completely drowned out discussions for Eternals and Hawkeye. This has reflected itself in the box office, where many of these projects are performing far below the Marvel average. Obviously, the blip hurt everything, but other studios have mostly recovered to pre-blip attendance numbers. And No Way Home shows us that MCU event films are stronger than ever. The Disney Plus shows have also steadily declined in ratings as they've continued to come out. During the Infinity Saga, the MCU was always able to grow its audience with each subsequent release. Not every movie would break records like the Avengers films, but you could be certain that they would grow their audience with each phase. The fact that this isn't carrying over to the television side is at the very least concerning. The more that the MCU puts out, the less likely it is for each individual project to make an impact. As the shows and films are released concurrently, oftentimes within days or even hours of each other, their opportunity to be discussed diminishes. Without that discussion, these projects stop being stories that impact culture and instead become content. A momentary distraction before ushering the audience along to the next attraction. Marvel in the past changed the game to better their odds, but their move to adapt to the new game has hurt their individual projects. The MCU has become another casualty in the streaming wars, a weapon used to get as much content on these platforms as possible so as to be more lucrative than their competition. It seems like the MCU has a lot of issues right now, but the one issue they don't have is a lack of greatness. I mean, it was great power comes great responsibility. Some of my favorite MCU moments have happened in Phase 4, including the romance between Wanda and Vision, all the wonderful variant Lokis we were introduced to, how Wenwu and John Walker were handled as antagonists, and it was really nice to see Sam Raimi bring back his chaotic horror energy. If I had to pick a favorite element, that bus scene from Shang-Chi might just be the best fight scene in the entire MCU. And while many Phase 4 projects missed the mark, it's undeniable that No Way Home was a smash success. Where the spin-offs have struggled, No Way Home excelled, reaffirming that Marvel is at its best when it brings its heroes together. But these pros have been countered by the mounting disappointments in each story. Not just the anticlimactic third acts throughout, but also their over-reliance on comic relief, the subpar color grading and compositing and the complete lack of an overall direction or connecting theme. The pros become less exciting when other Marvel films or blockbusters do them better, and the cons begin to compound as their persistent frequency makes them way more noticeable. Phase 1 wasn't perfect. 
but due to Marvel's planning and patience, it was greater than the sum of its parts. And Phase 4 is a collection of disconnected, entertaining, yet frustrating parts. In conclusion, go watch Moneyball. It's a very good movie. Well, that was an absolute beast of a video. I don't think I'll be covering an entire phase of Marvel projects anytime soon. Though, of course, I'm always down to cover Marvel, and if you want to see those videos, make sure to subscribe and check out my Marvel videos, you know, right here. Also, if you want to keep up to date with all things me, follow me on Twitter, and uh, if you've made it this far, let me know what your favorite project of Phase 4 has been. Mine would probably be Shang-Chi. You know, I still don't know how to end these things, so, uh...